Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Kress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. And we're going to continue in reading in the book The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives, a Roman Catholic book written by a Roman Catholic author about a Roman Catholic colony, Maryland, named after their goddess, Mary. And uh, what came out of the Maryland colony. And it's very important to our understanding of how this United States of America, described as the second beast in Revelation chapter 13, began with two horns, two horns like a lamb. In other words, it looked Christ like, Christian like, but it speaks as a dragon. How is it that the United States transformed from a Christian, a Christian like nation to that that speaks as the dragon? And our understanding of that can be gained by understanding this Maryland colony and the dynamics of the Carroll family. The predominant characters of this book are the Carols. And we're, get, we're getting into the nitty-gritty of this book now. We've talked about Charles Carroll and his son, Charles, also named Charles. Charles I and Charles II, I call them. And this is at the time of the Protestant Revolt in England and also in the colonies where the Catholic government of Maryland was overthrown and Protestants controlled Maryland and and the Catholics were denied to serve in politics. In other words, Maryland, the colonies began to look a bit like Britain because of Jesuit intrigue and... uh, other acts, the Protestants rose up. They weren't going to allow Catholicism to do as they'd always done, tried to rule the world, tried to rule Great Britain. And they knew that the the papacy would try to gain a hold in the colonies if they permitted it. Now, it is apparent from this book and from other readings of history that there was an attempt in Great Britain to cause Parliament to impose taxes upon the colonies, the purpose of which ultimately was to raise up a cry of of, uh, uh, revolution of the colonies against Great Britain. And one of those taxes that was levied was called the Stamp Act. It was passed by British Parliament and imposed a tax on the goods traded in the colonies. And this is where the Carols come in, interestingly. Now, we'll begin reading where we left off. It says, the Stamp Act was repealed but it was accompanied by a declaratory act which expressly rejected the claims of the colonists to the right to tax themselves and proclaimed the power of Parliament to make laws binding on the colonies and the people of America, quote, in all cases whatsoever, unquote. And it says the repeal of the Stamp Act meant nothing to the colonists for their claim of quote, no taxation without representation, unquote, was denied. And Parliament proceeded to pass other bills taxing them without their consent. All right. The Stamp Act was eventually repealed, but it was made clear to the colonists that Parliament had the right to levy taxes and that the colonists didn't have the right to uh, levy their own taxes. 
And this is all working toward creating a revolutionary attitude. Now, remember the Carroll family, both Charles I and Charles II had contacts in Britain, wrote letters back and forth, threatening revolution. But interestingly, they never disclose who, to whom those letters are written. Now, John Daniel suggests that the Jesuits were very busy in Great Britain at this time. And their ultimate desire was to have the colonies separated from Protestant Great Britain so that the Jesuits would be free to operate in the colonies. They wouldn't be suppressed, and that Catholicism would be unleashed from the, by, the, by, the bonds placed upon them by Protestants. And what do we see today? We see Jesuits running 28 of the most prestigious universities in this country and filling all political offices with Catholics. We see Catholicism, an accepted... Uh, an accepted form of Christianity. Protestants don't protest Rome at all. As a matter of fact, they've joined the ecumenical movement to reunite with the Catholic Church. So Jesuits have the run of the place. And what do you do? What happens when you give a Jesuit the run of the place? He takes over the government. I'm currently reading a book entitled The Secret History of the Jesuits by uh, Edmund Paris. And it, it's demonstrating a 500-year history of what the Jesuits do. They overthrow governments and place papists at the head of the governments and make the governments, make the nations bend the knee to the Pope. Now, reminded, we need to be reminded that by the time of the writing of the events in this book, the Jesuits had already had several hundred years of history to be judged by. It was clear what the purpose of the Jesuits were, was. And that was to bring the world into submission to the papacy and to destroy Protestantism. And I maintain, and I'm sure that John Daniel, when he comes to see us Wednesday, will confirm that the Carols were fomenting a revolution. And they had help in Britain, powerful people in Britain who had influence in Parliament. And the result of that, in, uh, that influence in Parliament was the issuance of of the Stamp Act and other taxations of the colonies which diminished the authority of the people in the colonies to govern themselves. Oppressive taxation leading to revolt because revolt against Protestant Great Britain was the ultimate goal. It says the Stamp Act was repealed, but it was accompanied by a declaratory act which expressly rejected the claims of the colonists to right, the, the right to tax themselves and proclaimed the power of Parliament to make laws binding on the colonies and the people of America, quote, in all cases whatsoever, unquote. The repeal of the Stamp Act meant nothing to the colonists, for their claim of no taxation without representation was denied, and Parliament proceeded to pass other bills taxing them without their consent. Now, Carroll took example, uh, excuse me, Carroll took ex ex exception to the endeavor of his English friend Graves to draw a parallel between the conditions in Ireland and America. Okay, Ireland was oppressed by. Britain, and he's comparing that oppression in Ireland, that British oppression of Ireland, to that of America, to make a point. Here's what he says. He says, Your position that Ireland and America belong to the king, lords and commons, is quite new, and I believe not warranted by any authority 
nor defensible upon the privilege, uh, the principles of reason or equity. Your forcible expression of belonging applied to Ireland is proper enough. England has all along treated the innocent and injured Irish as slaves and beasts of burden. But America, thank God, is too great a distance to be treated in that manner. The Americans have too much spirit to submit to such indignities and will in a few years have a force sufficient to repel them if offered. So here's another overt threat. The colonies are going to revolt. We're too far away for Britain to control us like this. We're too far away for Britain to impose these taxes upon us. And soon we'll have enough manpower and enough resources to defend ourselves in a revolution. And it says, in the same letter he indicates that he does not belong to the Rousseau school of philosophy, for he refers to Rousseau as that, quote, restless fanatical philosopher, unquote, who, quote, cannot live long in any place, unquote. Now, I won't get into Rousseauian philosophy. We're going to just keep moving along here. And he said it was while these letters were being written that he made the first acquaintance with George Washington. Okay, did you know that this Carroll, Charles Carroll, had a relationship with George Washington? That's never talked about. Anybody who does research into uh, Roman Catholic history and Jesuit history in the United States never mentions that George Washington had an acquaintance with the Carroll family. Now, this is something that I don't believe ought to be ignored. I don't have an agenda. I just want to know the truth. I want to believe the truth no matter what it is. Now, I, like all Americans, have been taught to revere George Washington. And I'm happy to remain in reverence of George Washington, provided that the history doesn't reveal an ulterior motive of George Washington. I'm happy to believe the truth no matter what it is. I just want the truth. And one can't say that he possesses the truth if he ignores certain facts of history. And I don't intend to ignore this. Now, what of this relationship between George Washington and the Carroll family? That ought to raise suspicion, at least enough to warrant further investigation. Now, if nothing's found in it, then fine. But if there's something found in that relationship between George Washington and the Carroll family, then it ought to be further investigated. It says that it was while these letters were being written that he made his first acquaintance with Washington, who visited Annapolis frequently. Washington had business relations with Carroll's father, Charles Carroll of One. Washington had business relations with Carroll's father concerning property in Fairfax County, Virginia, and his diary entries show that he sometimes dined at the Carroll fam- uh, at the Carroll home. George Washington owned property adjoining that of the Carroll family. The shared offense line, as we might say here in Iowa, agricultural capital of the, the United States. They shared a property line, adjoining properties. Is it possible that George Washington might have spoken across the fence with the Carrolls? Maybe, maybe not. But I know what we do here in Iowa. When we're out tilling the fields and we meet our neighbor across the fence, we shut the tractors off, get out, and share a cup of coffee. And we talk about things. Now, should we just ignore the fact that George Washington owned property adjacent to the Carroll families? And that they had a friendship or relationship? And that George Washington even dined 
at the home of the Carroll family? Should we ignore that? I don't intend to ignore it, even if nothing comes of it. Now, it says later, he, George Washington was chairman of a committee of the Virginia Assembly, which had charge of the work of improving navigation on the Potomac River. Now, do you suppose that George Washington might have had conversations with his neighbor, Charles Carroll, about this project of improving navigation on the Potomac River? That would be a, an interesting subject to discuss over a fence line with a cup of coffee, or in this case, maybe tea, <clears throat> and some tobacco, maybe. It says a company was formed to carry on the work, and a fund of 30,000 pounds was raised by subscription. And it says Charles Carroll of Carrollton was among the large subscribers. Now, the book doesn't tell us who created this company, but we certainly know the Carroll family and the Washington family had the resources to create the company. And the book openly admits that Charles Carroll of Carrollton was one of the large subscribers. One of the large subscribers had a vested interest. There's a common interest in this relationship between George Washington and the Carroll family. What other common interest did they have? That's a question for researchers to answer, to investigate. Now, it says it was not until 1773 that Charles Carroll made public his views on the relations between England and the colonies. All right. 1773, Charles Carroll abandons his hope of just living off his land and living a peaceful life, and he becomes a public figure in 1773, expressing his views on the relations between England and the colonies. The more letters he wrote, the stronger became his conviction that the only outcome was independence, but these had been views privately expressed. And as soon as he entered the public arena, he became the leader of the revolutionary party in Maryland. Has anybody ever talked about this in history? That this elite, blue-blooded, extraordinarily wealthy, powerful, and highly educated and privileged Roman Catholic family Charles Carroll II became a leader of the Revolutionary Party in Maryland. Now, why would a Roman Catholic, a privileged, blue-blooded Roman Catholic family, want to become the leader of a revolution of the colonies from Great Britain? Because prophecy's got to be fulfilled. The United States has to be separate from Protestant Great Britain. Catholicism has to be free to operate as it was restricted and suppressed in Britain. Rome needs unfettered control of the United States of America. And she's even willing to change her face. Instead of being a persecutory power, as she'd been for 1,500 years prior to this period of time, she's now the harbinger of peace and unity and liberty and religious freedom for all sects, Roman, Catholic, Protestant, and even Jew. I mean, here we are in this Maryland colony. Rome is com These Catholics have completely departed from standard Roman Catholic canon law, the authority of the papacy, have divorced themselves from all Roman Catholic history and have now become the champions of personal civil liberties and religious liberties in total contradiction to everything that's taught in Roman Catholicism. <clears throat> And this doesn't cause people to scratch their heads and wonder, what in the devil's going on here? Now, this book puts it out 
that we ought to be lauding this Carroll family and these Catholics for establishing a colony where they just opened their arms to Protestants, embraced them, and let them be a part of the government of this Maryland colony. Put down any religious persecution on it by any party against another, Protestant against Catholic or Catholic against Protestant, or both against a Jew. A utopia where every man can worship according to the dictates of his own conscience. And that a man has a right to choose who he will believe, in whom he will believe. This is a diametric departure from Catholicism. This book paints Catholicism as the author of what we now know today as democracy. Individuality. Liberty without religious or civil constraints. And we, we just dare not believe that that's what Roman Catholicism is. Because it's not. It's oppression. It's a monarchical structured institution that calls itself Christianity but is not Christianity at all. Now, here we have this Charles Carroll stepping up and becoming a leader of the Revolutionary Party in Maryland. He's going to organize all the colonies to, uh, to revolt against Protestant Great Britain. And he's going to get the accolades and the support of all the citizenry of this country. It says, since 1739, there was a standing grievance over the levy of a special tax for the payment of salaries or fees to the officials of the colony, which was as obnoxious as the tax for the support of the clergy. Remember, they were taxing the people after this Protestant revolt in the colonies. <clears throat> they made the Church of England the state-sponsored church. In other words, the taxpayer-sponsored church. The establishment of religion, which our Constitution forbids. The Constitution was not written yet at this point, and they made the, the, the Church of England the state-sponsored religion. And they taxed the people to pay for the clergy's salary, and now they're taxing the people to pay for the for the uh, the government, the servants in the government. And it says that this tax was as obnoxious as the tax for the support of the clergy. And in that year, the assembly raised an objection to it on the ground that it was an unconstitutional tax levied, like King Charles ship money, without the assent of the people. Remember, taxation without representation. This is a coin phrased, a co uh, this is a phrase coined by the Carroll family. Taxation without representation. We'll be back right after the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? 
I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone. Absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. If you wish to contact me, please email me at tom at seawaves. Dot US. That's Tom at S E A W A V E S dot US. Tom at Seawaves dot US. And also check out the website InquisitionUpdate.org. And if you would like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program, and we thank Brother Nicholas for recognizing the value of this information and putting it on the air. I wanted to make progress in this book today. This is a lengthy book. There's a lot of material to cover yet. yet. We're, we're nearing the last 25% of the book, but it's powerful stuff. And I feel compelled to stop and dwell on this issue of taxation without representation just to show you the hypocrisy in this. Now, before anybody, before anybody gets me wrong, let me explain. I don't believe in taxation without representation. That's the problem with the United States today. We're taxed to death. And for anyone to think that we have representation in Congress is a pipe dream. Okay, they're working for somebody else. And it's the business of this program, Inquisition Update, to show the listeners who they really work for. Who has the representation of Congress? Who enjoys the, the the representation of our congressmen, not the people who does. They're working for the papacy to help bring down this country. 
this Protestant land, this once Protestant land. They're going to make it Catholic. We're going to be done with the days of religious liberty in this country. You're either going to be Catholic and kowtow to this Pope's New World Order, or you're going to be smoke and ashes. Returning to the dark days of the Middle Ages when the Pope ruled supreme. Now let's talk more about that period of time when the Pope ruled supreme and this idea of taxation without representation that the Carroll family so heroically lauds, which became a byword, which became the banner of the revolution of the colonies from Protestant Great Britain. Taxation without representation. I can't speak for kids today, but I know when I was a kid, when you were in school, everybody knew what the phrase meant, taxation without representation. That was the banner of, uh, that, that flew over the revolution. That's what justified America from separating from Great Britain, although we were never told it had anything to do with religion. It had all to do with taxes, but trust me, it had everything to do with religion. Now, what about taxation without representation in Catholicism? The Carroll family being staunch Roman Catholics. What is the history of the Roman Catholic Church? Taxation. Peter's pence. Indulgences. Tribute from every king in every country to the papacy. And it was levied by the Pope and his cardinals and his curia to enrich the papacy, the riches of which are still plain to even the blind eye. And for those who doubt the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church, the incalculable wealth of the Roman Catholic Church, read the, simply read the book, The Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan, or Rich Church, Poor Church, by Malachi Martin, a Jesuit priest. If there's any doubt in your mind, if you've listened to any of the propaganda, oh, the Roman Catholic Church is poor. They put out so much money to all these, you know, cases against pedophile priests. Their dioceses are going bankrupt and they just don't have any money anymore. They're filthy rich. Their Jesuits control the central banks in the world. Every penny that you pay in taxes goes to their banks. Look, if there was ever an author in the world of taxation without representation, <laughs> it's the Pope. That's never taught, is it? No, we don't know anything about indulgences anymore. We don't know anything about Peter's Pence. We don't know anything about all the money-making schemes that the Pope used throughout the Middle Ages to steal from the people, to keep them poor and destitute and uneducated and compliant with, with threats of eternal damnation and excommunication, if they d even dreamed to think for themselves, and especially if they ever opened up the Scriptures and read it for themselves in their own language, and read the Word of God where it vividly describes in living color an unmistakable portrait of the Roman Catholic Church in Revelation chapter 17. You talk about slavery? We have no concept of the slavery that was imposed upon mankind during the Middle Ages. And the incalculable wealth and rape of the people by the papacy. <clears throat> a wealth that has been building for nearly two millennia, compounding itself. The papacy enriching itself through financing wars, world wars. And even as we've already touched in this book, at the time of, of, the, of the Protestant uprising in Britain, after... Henry VIII broke away from the papacy. The Roman Catholic Church controlled one-third of the productive land in Britain. One-third. <laughs> Taxation without representation? You've got to be kidding. 
the author of taxation without representation is the papacy. And here we have this Carol, this devout Roman Catholic, trained in Jesuit universities for 14 years, 17 years. What was it? 14, 13 years. Trained for 13 years in Jesuit schools. Comes to the colonies and lauds a banner, coins a phrase, taxation without representation, as a motivation to revolt against Protestant Great Britain. Now, you got to, if you're looking for hypocrisy, we found it. I have to impress upon the listeners just what a contrast this Maryland colony, this so called Roman Catholic colony, Maryland, what a contrast it was to Catholicism and its ancient history. This, this, uh, this Roman Catholic colony, if it were in Europe, it would have been overthrown by the Pope. He would have gathered all the surrounding kings and said, take over Maryland and convert it back to Catholicism. There's no religious liberty in Roman Catholicism. You're either Catholic or you're toast. If that's not the case, then what happened to the hundreds of millions of people who died in the Inquisitions and the Crusades, who simply refused to be Catholic? What happened to the Waldenses? What happened to the Albigenses? What happened to the Protestants? What happened to the Huguenots? What happened to the Anabaptists? The land, the world is literally soaked with the blood of the saints. And who shed the blood? The Pope. And anybody who thought to withhold their taxes from the Pope was seized. And so was his property. The Vatican is the greatest single landholder on the planet. That's taxation without representation. That's forced tax taxation. Anybody who attempted to revolt from Rome was summarily destroyed. And it's just inconceivable that we can believe that this Carroll family, this Roman Catholic elite trained, Jesuit-trained Carroll family could be the true authors of religious and political and civil liberties in this, in this Roman Catholic colony and still have the blessings of Rome, still have the support of the Jesuit order. Remember, there's Jesuit, Jesuits operating in this colony. Of course, we don't talk about them too much in this book because... Uh, we really don't want the readers of this book to know what the Jesuits were really up to in this Maryland colony. This author's disingenuous. This book paints a picture that, even though it is true, runs counter to everything we know about the history of the Roman Catholic Church. And they still have the support of the papacy. So what's the papacy up to? What are these Carol, these Catholic Carols up to? What is the Maryland colony all about? And it says, since 1739, there was a standing grievance over the levy of a special tax for the payment of the salaries or the fees of the officials of the colony, which was as obnoxious as the tax for the support of the Protestant clergy of the Church of England that, that took over. Establishment of religion in the Maryland colony. And it says, in that year, the assembly raised an objection to it on the ground that it was an unconstitutional tax levied like King Charles's ship money, without the assent of the people. And it says the tax continued to be levied and collected, but it was not without continual remonstrances from the lower house. 
The fees had been fixed by the assembly from year to year and paid to the officers of the province, either in money or tobacco, in place of salaries. The lower house in 1770 claimed that the fees were exorbitant and that in one case an officer had been guilty of taking illegal fees. A bill was passed by the house lowering lowering and regulating the fees. This was opposed by the council, the upper house. There were several members of the council who benefited by the excessive fees, among them being Daniel Delaney, Jr., a well-known attorney and the son of the lawyer who advised Charles Carroll of Dorigan and Dr. Charles Carroll in their controversy. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Delaney was secretary of the province, an appointive, not an elective office. The lower house not only insisted that the fees be lowered, but ordered the arrest of the officer who had illegally taken them. This created a deadlock between the two houses. Governor Eden cut short the dis- the, the disagreement by proroguing the assembly, in other words, adjourning the assembly, the assembly, and then fixing the fees by proclamation. So here we have a political wrangling, a, a political dispute on raging, and they simply brought the assembly to a halt, and uh, Governor Eden made a proclamation fixing the fees. He just took over. All right, and it says, The will of the representative of the people being discarded by this arbitrary action of the governor, there arose considerable discontent when it became known that the clergy of the established church, the Church of England, had taken advantage of the situation to claim an additional 10 pounds of tobacco per poll. So they kind of operated like our Congress does. You know, pass laws and resolutions after Congress is adjourned. Or do it at midnight when nobody, on Christmas morning when nobody's paying attention. And it says the fees of the officials and the clergy were claimed to be justified by a law passed in 1702, which the governor claimed was now in force as the legislature had failed to take action. So since he he prorogued the assembly, it threw it threw the regulation back on an old law passed in 1702. And it says at this juncture there appeared in the America and the Maryland Gazette an anonymous communication. Now this is interesting. There appeared in the Maryland Gazette an anonymous communication which made the claim that the laws of 1702 was void because the assembly which passed it and which met on March 16th of that year had been summoned by writs running in the name of King William III, who died on March 8th. So on the basis that the author of, of, of uh, the one who called the, the, uh, the meeting died before the meeting was even held, so therefore the law passed was null and void. And it says, this was immediately followed by another communication which appeared in the form of an imaginary dialogue, an imaginary dialogue between two citizens, one opposing the governor and the council, and the second citizen defending them. The writer, who was ingenious, prepared the article so that second citizen, the second citizen, apparently demolished the arguments of the first citizen and presumably carried off the honors of the debate. Everyone recognized this as the work of Delaney, chief beneficiary of the fee system. And it says, thereupon a communication appeared signed by first citizen, the first recognized as the first citizen, heretofore anonymous, claiming that his side of the case had not been fairly presented in the dialogue. He answered the arguments of Delaney in an exceedingly able and convincing manner. When it became known that the writer of this letter was Charles Carroll of Carrollton, he at once became the recognized champion of popular rights. 
he had dramatically taken the role of the straw man Delaney thought he had knocked down. He took the broad position that the fees which were to be levied were nothing more than taxes, and that no taxes could be laid except by the representatives of the people. In other words, that there should be no taxation without representation. Now listen to this. It says, here was, the, was first raised the battle cry of the American Revolution by Charles Carroll in an argument, an anonymous argument that was orchestrated between Charles Carroll and Delaney. There, out of this, out of this dialogue in the newspaper, which everybody read, was coined the phrase "taxation without representation," which became the battle cry of the American Revolution, and it was given to us by Charles Carroll, a Roman Catholic. Now, if you think about this for a while, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Now, it says, Carroll showed his knowledge of English constitutional history and law throughout the controversy. Remember, this man is extraordinarily trained and educated in the best colleges in Europe. An extremely well-to-do and privileged family to send their children over to Europe to be trained at St. Omer's, sent to the best law schools in Britain, and then come back to the colony. You think that education is going to go to waste? <clears throat> Not on your life. And it says, in the exchange of the letters in the columns of the Old Maryland Gazette, he was more than a match for Delaney, who, although an able lawyer, did not possess the scholarship of Charles Carroll. Charles Carroll had an education background that he could whip anybody in a debate. Anybody that wasn't as equally trained as Carroll and Delaney was no match for him. And it says Carroll had the support of public opinion. And why wouldn't he? He took the side of the public to throw off this taxation without representation. Charles Carroll was becoming a hero in the colonies. He said Carroll had the support of public opinion and his, co uh, and his cognomen, or his nickname, what he became known as, First Citizen. He was called First Citizen. That's what they recognized him as, First Citizen. When it, was a, when it became apparent that he was the... the, the, the uh, the one in this debate called First Citizen, that's what they nicknamed him. And his nickname was taken from the dialogue, and that nickname clung to him so that he was later actually recognized as Maryland's First Citizen. So this man became famous overnight because of his stand against the taxation without representation levied against the colonies by Protestant Great Britain. And he says his claim that the, quote, settling of fees and the imposition of taxes are powers belonging to the representatives of the people, unquote, was stated in effect, the, which uh, was stating in effect the case of the American colonies against Great Britain. It was apparent. Now, he used this, this, this case of how the Maryland colony was forcibly taxing the citizens of Maryland to help support the established church and to help and, and to pay the, the, the salaries of those uh, who were in the, in the parliament. They used that as an example for an even greater conflict, the revolution. Taxation without representation. They first had to make it a local problem to raise the cry of taxation without re representation in Maryland itself and then easily apply that same logic 
against Protestant Great Britain for the purpose of fomenting the Revolutionary War. And it said it was apparent that he was the champion of the cause of all the colonies against the encroachments of the king and parliament, as well as the cause of the Maryland colonists against the usurpations of the governor and the council. How masterful these people are at orchestrating and moving the minds of people. And what's the direction? Revolution on the basis of taxes, which avoids the subject altogether, the real the real gist behind the revolution was to separate the United States from Roman uh, from from Protestant Great Britain control. This was all about religion. The revolutionary war was all about religion. And they simply took the attention away from the real motive of the Revolutionary War and made it a war against unfair taxation. And we're still, most Americans still operate under the premise that we revolted against Great Britain because they were unfairly taxing us. And they've they've shifted our minds away from any concept at all about the true reason for the Revolutionary War. That is the craft of Jesuitry. That is the success of Jesuitry. To operate behind the scenes, remaining incognito, out of, out of, out of sight, out of mind, but achieving their diabolical goals through cooperative third parties under completely false pretenses. They achieve their ulterior motives, their, their ulterior goals, and no one is ever the wiser. And it's for God's people to sort this out and become wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross Fork. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel. 
waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org